and welcome to the third video about pulmonary function testing. So we're going to talk about the different types of lung function tests out there. There's a couple of different types out there. Like we talked about previously, some uh, will look at uh, how deep you can breathe, others will look at how fast you can breathe, uh, other ones will look at your neural control of breathing, other ones like a diffusion of breathing. So this can get pretty involved. So let's get started. Remember, you could take time uh, with any of these parts of the presentation uh, and then your chapter in your Egan's book uh, should be able to go over it more and then I do have additional resources that I'll either try to link to the video or I'll have it in your blackboard as well. The first test that we'll talk about is the slow vital capacity. This is done with all complete pulmonary function tests. So the slow vital capacity done with all complete pulmonary function testing. And this is a great way to look at vital capacity. Now remember, we talked about our volume and capacity box where we said, hey, this is our total lung capacity. This is, you know, your IRV, VT, tidal volume. ERV, the residual volume, and then we have our inspiratory capacity, FRC, and then we have our vital capacity and then residual volumes left over. So when we're looking at this, we're trying to look at vital capacity. So that's this one right here. We're trying to look at 80% of the lungs there, because remember 20% of it's trapped in there, that's residual volume. That's not gas that will come out. So we want to see how much volume can you actually maneuver uh, in and out of your lungs. So that's a vital capacity. So the procedure for this test, you're going to start at total lung capacity. So you're going to have them take a deep breath in and then blow but it's going to be a slow and sustained. Slow and sustained is the key word here. Slow and sustained is the key word. So this slow sustained exhalation is great. Uh, and you're gonna make them do this as far as they possibly can. Uh, so why would we do a non-forced one? Why wouldn't we just have them blow as fast and as hard as they can? Why would we do a slow vital capacity versus a forced vital capacity maneuver? Well, one of the best things that we can look at here is looking at what happens to the lungs if you exhale forcefully and fast. If you have really floppy airways, right? Let's say you have really floppy airways from emphysema or chronic bronchitis, smoking that caused destruction of the walls of your airways, especially your medium to small airways. Uh, what's going to happen if you exhale really fast is these areas, as they start to exhale really fast, will create suction and close. So you have premature closure of those airways. Well, this isn't good because then I don't get a functional view of how much volume their lungs can actually contain because it's trapped gas. All this gas in here just stays trapped and builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. So when we do a slow vital capacity, it allows for a sustained exhalation so that way we don't have premature closure of those medium to small airways. That means we get a more accurate view of what their lungs can actually contain. And we'll do some case studies with this as well. So if I have someone just blow up forcefully into a device and they have air trapping gas that gets trapped by this process, then we're not going to get a good view of how much volume they can contain and then it will look like they have both a restrictive and obstructive disease when in fact they just might have an obstructive disease process. So we don't get any flow rates from this test. This test just looks at volumes and capacities. So therefore this test is great for looking at restrictive issues. Great for looking at restrictive issues. What patients benefit most from this test? Those would be your not only restrictive patients, but also your patients with premature airway closure, such as with COPD emphysema or possibly asthma, right? So it's a great test to make sure that they only have an obstructive, that they don't also have a restrictive issue. So slow vital capacities, great for people with air trapping uh, as well. So that way we can make sure we get the most accurate volumes out of them. So the procedure, tell them to take a deep breath in as deep as they can, and then slowly and fully exhale as far as they possibly can go until they're all the way empty. And that's it, that's the slow vital capacity. Great for looking at volumes and capacities. It is not 
I repeat, it is not for looking at obstruction or flow rates. All right, so how do I do this in more detail? Well, first things first, I'm going to have them start with slow tidal volume breathing. Slow tidal volume breathing, you'll see it on the spirogram. After about three to four good tidal volume breaths, then the patient will maximally inhale as deep as they can, and then exhale as completely as they can too. So they're going to exhale, 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 and then they go back up once they're done, right? So they're going to exhale as completely as they can. Um, it should be done as slow and as complete as possible. And one of the biggest things, and you see me put it in bold here, is it should have a stable tidal volume. The tidal volume should be within a couple hundred mLs uh, of each other, but it needs that stable tidal volume. Because what if you're breathing at really deep tidal volumes, right? Someone's looking at you breathing, you're not going to breathe normal. Right? Tell someone to breathe normal and stare at them. Are they going to breathe normal? No, they're going to breathe abnormal if you tell them to do that. Well, same thing when you're doing a pulmonary function test. So you're just trying to let the tidal volume stabilize, uh, and it's got to be within a certain volume of each other before we take that deep breath in. And then exhale as maximally, but not as fast, as maximally as possible. A large tidal volume or an irregular uh, pattern might reduce their volumes and capacities. And in other words, a different way of saying this last statement down here, that it reduces their expiratory reserve volume, their inspiratory reserve volume, or their inspiratory capacity. Another way of saying that is it makes it look like they have a more restrictive process than they actually do if it reads out that low. So getting a stable tidal volume is the key to making sure you get accurate volumes and capacities with these. So don't have them take that deep breath in and, and blow out until that tidal volume is stable. Uh, and you'll be able to see this on the machine as well, and we'll practice this in class. What determines a good and acceptable test? Well, the maximum that you should see is you should see a plateau right you should see a plateau at maximum inhale and maximum exhale so just like i drew on the previous slide so you're going to see that tidal volume you want to see three to four breaths of a stable tidal volume and then you're going to take a deep breath in you should see a little plateau at the top here that means they're all the way in and then you should see a plateau at the bottom there as well that means they're all the way out so that means that you've got the maximum inhale and the maximum exhale out of them in other words the effort was good that's a sign of good effort if you if they had nothing left to give you which is what those plateau means uh, that's a sign of a good test so that you need at least two acceptable vital capacities within 150 mls of each other or five percent depending on the patient size of course but you need them within 150 mls or five percent uh, vital capacity should be within 200 mls of the forced vital capacity. So if you're comparing the slow vital capacity to the forced vital capacity, they should be equal. Now what happens, and this is a board question, if the forced vital capacity number is larger than the slow vital capacity? Well, that usually means their effort on the slow vital capacity was poor, and you need to go back to repeat the slow vital capacity. Sounds like a great exam question too. So I'll repeat that again. If a forced vital capacity, where we have them exhale fast, same procedure, but exhale fast. Uh, if that's larger, uh, more than 200 mLs larger uh, than the slow vital capacity, then we're ha gonna have to have them go and repeat the slow vital capacity because it means their effort on the slow vital capacity was poor. What does it mean if it is not within 200 mLs of the FVC? Sometimes, it, what if the slow vital capacity is higher than the forced vital capacity? Well, that can happen if they have an airway obstruction or airway collapse or premature closure, like I drew previously, right? Pretend they have an emphysematic small to medium airways that just collapse prematurely if you force it out. So that also could mean if their slow vital capacity is larger than their forced vital capacity, it could mean there's premature closure and therefore air trapping built up. And that's why we're not getting that volume out of there. So it doesn't necessarily mean an uh, effort issue if the slow vital is higher than the forced vital uh, if they have an obstructive airways disease.
So if the slow vital is greater than force vital, that could be obstructive disease or air trapping present. If the force vital is greater than slow vital, then their effort on the slow vital is poor and it needs to be repeated. All right, we talked about the slow vital capacity. Great for looking at volumes and capacities. We do not get flow rates. However, with a forced vital capacity, we get both volumes and flow rates. We get both volumes and flow rates. This is the most common performed PFT test is the forced vital capacity. I'll repeat that again because it's a great exam question. It is the most common performed pulmonary function test doing a forced vital capacity. You get both volumes and capacities. Um, uh, you also get flow rates from it. Uh, it is not an easy test and the patient can tire out uh, pretty easily with this. Uh, so you got to be careful of that situation. When we're looking at this test, we do need to be sure that if they do start to tire out, that that's something we record uh, for the record. Uh, so that way the physician can interpret this uh, as well, knowing that they were fatiguing with the procedure. So they might have to reschedule the procedure if they want more accurate values, if we can't get reproducible results. Uh, all the measurements that we do with pulmonary function are measured in BTPS. Well, why is that? Well, when you're exhaling, it's going to be at body temperature, pressure saturated. Okay, what does that have to do with anything, you may ask? Well, if it's at body temperature, pressure saturated, uh, that can affect the volumes, right? Uh, and it can affect the way that it's read out compared to standard temperature pressure dry, right? Hopefully you remember this from your science class, STPD versus BTPS. And so that can affect our contents and capacities. So that's why everything that we do is calibrated to BTPS, body temperature, pressure saturated. And I'll put a link uh, in your blackboard about this. If someone is an air trapper, uh, what may happen to the volume part of the measurement? Well, if they're trapping gas, right, we're not going to be able to get that gas out. If they have floppy airways from that, you know, smoking and destruction of their, their respiratory zone, so if it prematurely closes and collapses as they exhale, right, it's going to build up. And so the volumes that they exhale are going to be small during a forced vital capacity. But a slow vital capacity may not cause that premature closure. So that's the advantage of doing both a slow and a forced vital capacity. So if someone is an air trapper, they might have lower expiratory volumes and capacities uh, with this procedure, right? Could it be accurate in flows with air trappers? Uh, yeah, uh, it's still going to get accurate flow rates for these patients no matter what. So someone has COPD, emphysema, uh, uncontrolled asthma, are we still going to get accurate flow rates from this test? Absolutely. It's just their volumes and capacities might read low if they're trapping gas. Coaching is the key component to this, uh, making sure that you know the spirometer you're using, whether you start at TLC, whether the patient inhales to total lung capacity and then exhales to a residual volume, right? So you gotta know your spirometer, you gotta know the equipment that you're using. Most of the equipment out there now is pretty intuitive. Uh, and then if you don't know, you can always observe or do one on a coworker or someone like that. Um, as when you're looking at this, you got to make sure you know your equipment, when to hit record, right? When to follow the prompt so that way it records accurately. So make sure you know your equipment and know how to record it. Uh, that can be a little nerve wracking sometimes, but you'll see the equipment nowadays are much more friendly uh, than what they were in the past. Uh, make sure you have the patient sit or stand. Sitting is the preferred method. Um, however, they may, need to be sitting up straight. And so posture or position is something that you should record on the report. Uh, was the patient sitting? Was the patient standing? Was the patient had poor posture, right? Were they hunched over and just small volume hunched over closure? Or were they standing up or were they sitting up tall, right? So coaching them to sit up tall, squeeze the orange between their uh, their scapula, right? That whole thing, like to have their chest open up so they can take deep breaths and exhale deeply. 
are all things that can help them out. Uh, nose clips are usually preferred for most uh, PFTs. Once again, volume uh, can escape or air can escape through the nose, the nasopharynx. So you can both entrain and exhale through the nose, right, hopefully. So by closing it, by giving them nose clips, you avoid some of that loss of volume or flow rates. So that way, the only gas going in and out is through that mouthpiece, and that's the goal get all the gas going in and out through that mouthpiece. So that's why nose clips are preferred. And you might be uh, have to demonstrate this for the patient. Usually things go a lot faster when you do demonstrate it for the patient in my personal experience. So I'm going to have you take a deep breath in as deep as you can and then blow all the way out really hard, right? And so blast it as hard as you can. Once you're all the way out, take a deep breath in, right? So I always try to show them that ahead of time just so they can sort of see what it should look like versus just sort of hearing. Not many people can just hear something and be able to do it right away. So showing them it in front of them can be a very, very helpful tactic. So what is the force vital capacity measure? And when we're looking at its measurement, uh, they're measured in mLs or in liters. Uh, and so it just depends what we have the equipment set up for. So we can see that it measures vital capacity, which is one of the big things we look at is how much volume the lungs have their inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume. Remember, all these are included in their vital capacity. How long they exhaled, so force expiratory volume time, that little T is for time. So remember, if they have low volumes, then that usually means it's a restrictive issue, whether it's a chest wall abdomen issue or a tissue issue like pulmonary fibrosis, or it could be low flow rates, which would be obstructive. So flow rates also come from this test, your FEV 1%, which we'll talk about uh, in the next slide, actually. So you'll get volumes and flow rates from this test. That's why it's the most common test that's out there. So if the volumes are low, if they have a low vital capacity, low IRV, low ERV, if those are all low, then that would indicate a restrictive pathology is present. If those are low and they're flow rates are low, then that would mean they have a combined condition. So we'll go through some practices later on, but for now, make sure you understand what it measures. It measures both volumes and flow rates when we look at a forced vital capacity. Uh, the ones that are highlighted here are volumes, and then FEVT is time. And if someone has emphysema, if they have an obstructive airway disease, it can take a lot longer for them to empty the lungs. They've lost a lot of elasticity. And so it might have a longer time to get their lungs to plateau on exhalation. So we'll talk about that here briefly uh, coming up. FEV1, so now we're starting to get into flow rates. Uh, FEV1 is the forced expiratory volume in one second, right? In one second. All right. So at one second, I'm going to have you take a deep breath in, blow out really hard and fast, just for that one second. That one second tells us how much volume they can exhale in that first second. So that's what we're seeing here. And it, looking at volume over time, and volume over time is a definition for flow rate, right? So this is a flow rate, right? So FEV1 is a flow rate. So if the FEV1 is low, this usually means they have either poor effort or it's an obstructive obstructive pathology like uh, asthma, COPD, uh, chronic bronchitis, uh, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, right? Any of those obstructive diseases, uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, if the FEV1 and the FBC are the most common standardized test for obstructive disease, right, most common. So if we do a force vital capacity, that's the most common test. And then from the force vital capacity is where we get this, right? This is a subcategory. This is something, the FEV1 is something we get from the force vital capacity. Right, so we have them do a force vital capacity. One of the numbers that we see there is the FEV1. That's what we're talking about now. So this is under the umbrella. This is under the tree of a forced vital capacity test. So if I want to get someone's FEV1, I'm going to have them do a forced vital capacity maneuver. And from that maneuver, I'll get my FEV1. So it's great for looking for obstructive diseases because flow rates, when the flow rates are decreased, we're seeing obstructive pathology. 
So how much you can exhale in the first second is what we're looking at here. So when we're looking at this, if we have the FEV1, uh, there's something called the FEV1 percent. Uh, and this is the one where, remember how everything normally is 80 to 120 percent are predicted? This is the one where the lower limit of normal is 70 percent. So it should be above 70 percent um, when you do this one. So you should be able to exhale 70 percent or more of your gas in the first second. I'll repeat that again. When you do a force vital capacity, you should be able to exhale 70% or more of the gas in that first second. If it is not at least 70%, that means the gas is moving slower. That means you probably have an obstructive airways issue. So an FEV 1% is a little bit different. FEV 1 is the first force expiratory volume in the one second. What differs with the FEV1 to the FEV1%, right? That little percent thing is the pesky thing. What differs there is we're comparing the FEV1 to the force vital capacity. So that's what makes it a percent. Well, FEV1% means we are, we're percent of predicted or percent of what they have. So we're comparing it to their force vital capacity. So that's the calculation for FEV 1%. So FEV 1, just the force expiratory volume in one second. FEV 1%, we want that above 70%. Uh, and what does that percent come from? It comes from comparing it to their forced vital capacity. The other flow rate that we'll see here is a peak expiratory flow rate, especially when we start to talk about peak flow meters. Um, that's something else that we'll look at there. The peak flow meters are going to be one of the um, easy at home things that uh, most people with obstructive airways, especially asthma, can use to monitor their, their current lung status at home and help them direct care without having to go in as often. So pretty nifty tool there as well. So force expiratory flow uh, at 200 to 1200 is the next one. Uh, the 200 to 1200, and I'll, I have a graph that represents these. The 200 to 1200 is it throws out the first 200 mLs that they exhale because that's going to be of, of muscle and all that other stuff. So it looks at flow rates through the large airway. So your trachea, your main stem bronchi, those types of things. So if you see large numbers, FEF 200 to 1200, right? Uh, it hits that liter, right, from one, uh, 200 mLs to 1200 mLs. That first, uh, that liter within that range there is what it's looking at, and it's saying, hey, that's your large airways. So if there's if that's low for some reason, there's an obstruction in your large airways. So you see large number, 200 to 1200. Think large airways. Uh, FEF 25 to 75 percent, or FEF 25 to 75 percent, same thing. This is for your medium to small airways. So think asthma, emphysema, uh, those type of things. So we're looking at all these flow rates. That way we can see if there's an obstruction, not only if there is an obstruction, if there is, where is it? Is it in the large airways with the 200 to 1200? Or is it in the small airways with the 25 to 75 percent? So that's the advantage there. So the FEV 1%, this compares the FEV1 to FVC like we were talking about before. So what makes this percent a percent is we're going to take the FEV1 that the test gives us and we're going to compare it to the forced vital, uh, forced vital capacity number that we've seen there. <laughs> uh, so that should be uh, helpful. Here we go. Forced vital capacity. There we go. All right. So that's what makes it the percent. Um, this amount is used uh, uh, it, to help us understand how their small airways are functioning. Um, so it looks at flow rate, which flow rate by the definition is volume over time. If an FEV1 percent is low, then that usually means the patient has an obstructive 
disorder, right? So FEV1 to FVC, if it's low, then that usually means it's obstructive. Then we can look at the 200 to 1200 uh, to see if it's large airways, or we can look at the 25 to 75% and see if it's small airways. So uh, this distinguishes obstruction in normals, 70 to 85%. So when you exhale, your forced vital capacity, you should be at least 70% of it should come out within that first second. So 200 to 1200 in more detail, it's the average flow rate during different parts of the exhalation maneuver. This is going to be during the early parts. Uh, 200 to 1200 is going to be the early parts. 25 to 75 is going to be that middle part of the test. So looking at that first part is going to tell us about the first part of your airways, your large airways. So the way I remembered it as a student, large number, large airways, right? Uh, that liter gas that's exhaled after the first 200 come out. So that would be like your oral pharynx, your, your laryngopharynx, right? Those type of things. So you're exhaling, you're getting rid of that 200 ml, that first 200 ml. And then after that, right, is when you start measuring a liter of gas. How fast did that liter of gas come out? Well, if that first uh, amount came out slowly, then that could tell us your large airways have an obstruction of some sort, whether it's a tumor in the trachea or something like that's going on. The 25 to 75% is the average flow during the middle 50% of a force vital capacity test. And you're like, Derek, this isn't making any sense. Well, hopefully you got your book somewhere around you. If you don't, I got a graphic coming up for you that well, I'll draw all over with you and we'll go through it together. So um, when we're looking at this, if I want to look at my small airways, my little tiny airways that are more prone to destruction with COPD, emphysema, uh, that type of thing, which of these two flow rates would represent the medium to small airways? Well, that'd be the medium to small number, right? That middle 50%, because that's going to look at the gas that's been exhaled a little bit past that first liter of gas. So here is a picture of the 25 to 75%. Uh, I took this one directly from your book. Uh, so here, when we have this patient exhale, right, FEF 25 to 75. So we have them exhale. We're not measuring the flow rates for that first 25%. We're not measuring flow rates after that 25%. We're measuring flow rates here in this middle 50%, right, this middle 50%. So after uh, that, we can sort of see what their flow rates are for their medium to small airways, medium to small airways. So hopefully this picture sort of helps you out. We take the first quarter of the breath that they breathed out, not going to look at that. We take the last quarter, we're not going to look at that. We're just going to look at that middle 50%. That'll tell us about medium to small airways. Here is the 200 to 1200, very similar, first 200 mLs, uh, we're going to throw out that uh, can be effort, that can be uh, muscles, that can be oropharynx, laryngopharynx, gas and all that stuff, so we're trying to get that out of the system. Out, once that's out, we need to look at what's in that trachea, so we're going to look at that liter, so from that 200 mLs to that 1200 mL range, that's what we're going to look at here is gas between the 200 and the 1200. So how fast did that 200 to 1200 come out? If it came out slow, then that means that your large airways have an obstructive condition going on, like tracheal malacia or something like that's going on, um, or tracheal stenosis, right? So those are your large airway issues. If it's normal, obviously, then we don't have to worry, but it's a large airway issue if it's low. Uh, some quick notes here, FEF versus VMAX. Uh, this is just talking about words. Now, if you get really confused with words, skip ahead, come back to this when you got all the rest of the concepts down, right? Then come back to this timestamp, right? Uh, so when you're looking at the FEF 25% FEF 50% and FEF 75%, these are just different perspectives at looking at the flow rates, okay? So this, we're going to get a little deep here. So if you need to take a break, take a break. All right, so this looks at the volumes at different parts of the FE, FBC test. So this looks at how much has been exhaled. So FEF 75% would mean that how much has been exhaled? 75%, right, has been exhaled. There we go. Uh, the VMAX is a little bit different. So you have the VMAX 75, VMAX 50, VMAX 25. Notice that this goes backwards, right? FEF went 
25, 50, 25, 50, 75. This one goes 75, 50, 25, right? So that one looks at how much has been exhaled. You've exhaled 75% of that gas, right? The other one is the flow rate, uh, looking at the different parts of the test, looking at the volumes remaining in your lungs, remaining in your lungs. So how much is still in your lungs? So uh, a VMAX 25% uh, percent would actually mean that there's 25% percent of the vital capacity left so if we switch this for vmax hold on here v max okay vmax all right vmax 25 percent which would mean that 25 percent of the gas is still in your lungs which means that you've exhaled most of that gas so these are just two different perspectives one's looking at how much has been exhaled the other one is looking at the volume that's remaining in your lungs, right? One's how much volume you have out, the other one's how much volume you still have in. One's volume you have out much out, the other one's volume you have in. Uh, these are just different ways to look at it. Uh, did I come up with this? Heavens, no. Uh, but this way you're aware that these sort of are opposites, but not really opposites, just different ways of looking at it. One's how much have you put in through the machine, how much you air you've blown out of your lungs. The other one's how much air you still have left in your lungs. So these are flow rates, FEFs, so force expiratory flow, or flow max, right? Their max flow rate at 25%, the max flow rate, right? So these are, once again, looking at flow rates, they look at obstruction, but it's just the perspective that makes it a little bit different. All right, here you're going to see spirograms, uh, and then here is the start of a flow volume loop directly from your chapter. And here we get a uh, force FEV1. Here we go, FEV1. So at one second, we measure how much volume that is. And so that looks like around almost four liters there. Let's say it's 3.95 liters, right? So that's how much volume they exhaled in one second. Hopefully that's at least 70% of what they got out at the end of the test. And usually the test need to go, needs to be exhaled at least six seconds, right? We usually we try to make sure it's at least six seconds in length. So that's gonna be one of our primary things that we have to make sure on is that expiratory time is appropriate to make sure we get the best effort to for a lot of these patients. So at 1%, and then hopefully we see a plateauing, which usually means we've got their best effort. So we have the patient exhale, and they're exhaling, and at 1% it's measuring it, and then they plateau. Okay, we got the full test. You should go at least six seconds, but uh, the FEV1 is the big one, because we're gonna compare it to the FVC, which is how much they totally exhaled, and we get our FEV1%. Okay, so that's that. the graph on the left. The graph on the right over here, Right, this graph on the right here. Uh, this one's a little bit different. This is a flow volume loop. This is even on mechanical ventilators. So you can see this on vented patients, which is a great advantage for your obstructive patients that are on the ventilator. You got some with severe COPD on the ventilator, severe asthma on the ventilator. The flow volume loop can be very helpful, especially now that you'll know what it means. Uh, so the same thing, volume is on the x-axis. So here you see the force of auto capacity. It's on the x-axis. And the vertical axis is, yep, the vertical axis is flow rate or how fast they are. So this is where the patient exhales right and then when they exhale this will measure that middle 50 percent here we see this right remember the the fef 25 to 75 percent the peak expiratory flow rate is up here so when they exhale what's the fastest they got well that'd be up there then we look at the middle 50 percent to look at medium to small airways uh and then once they're all the way out then we're going to have them take a deep breath in and that's called your peak inspiratory flow rate your pif is your peak inspiratory flow rate why would we do that? Why, don't we care about how much they exhale and how fast they exhale? Yes, we do. But what if we're looking at an upper airway issue? What if we're looking for vocal cord dysfunction or something like that? If we are, if we're looking for something like vocal cord dysfunction, then you'll want a flow volume loop because it tells you if there's an upper airway obstruction, having them take a deep breath in once they're all the way out. <sighs> We can see that peak inspiratory flow rate. If that peak inspiratory flow rate is variable or has low, low things going on with it, then we know that there's something that could be going on with their upper airway. It's kind of cool.
All right, let's do some challenge questions here. All right, so here's the scenario. All right, you got a patient. They measured uh, four liters. What's predicted for their high age gender is four liters. So they're currently at 100% of predicted. So when I look at this, this is the way I do it. I look at volumes, restrictive, and then I look at flow, obstructive. Okay. So you can set up your own scorecard the way you can. I have a scorecard set up in your Blackboard as well. You can see it in there. So this is what I'm looking at. So vital capacity, we'll pretend this is a slow vital capacity, right? So slow vital capacity, is that a volume or a flow rate? Well, that's a volume. So this one was normal. So if my volumes are normal, then I don't have a restrictive issue. Uh, what about my force vital capacity? My force vital capacity also is normal. Right, so that tells me once again volumes. Okay, so right now I've sort of ruled out a restrictive issue. Do you see that? I've ruled out a restrictive pathology because the volumes were normal. Now I'm going to be looking at flow rates. Right now I'm going to be looking at flow rates. Uh, FEV1 uh, is right here. The FEV1 is 100% of predicted, so that flow rate's normal. When I compare it to the force vital capacity, it's 75%, which is above normal, right? Above the lower limit of 70%. So right now, what is this? Is this a restrictive disease, obstructive disease, or is this patient within normal limits? So this shows that they are within normal limits for their pulmonary function values. So uh, this is just to sort of get your feet wet and looking at this, looking at the measured versus the predicted versus the percent of predicted. Uh, and the percent of predicted is the big one to pay attention to because we want their normals to be 80 to 120 unless it's the FEV1 percent, right? So we'll start there with your basic spirometry. So let's do some more practice. Hopefully you'll find this pretty valuable. All right, challenge question number two. All right, so I'm going to make my own little scorecard. So volumes, restricted, uh, flow rates, obstructive. However you want to do it, right, come up with your own one. If it's really good and helpful, let me know, right? Uh, I'm always willing to learn some of that stuff. That's pretty cool. All right, so uh, they measured at two liters, right? Uh, what was predicted for this patient was four liters, so that's 50% of predicted. So right now the slow vital capacity is decreased. All right, so right now I'm thinking restrictive pathology. Okay, uh, force vital capacity is at 50% of predicted. Same thing, predicted it uh, at four liters, they only got two liters. So right now that's also given me a restrictive issue. All right, now I'm going to look at my flow rates. Uh, I'm looking at my FEV1. Uh, they only got uh, 1.5 liters, but their predicted was 3 liters, so they're, that's not very good there. However, the FEV1% the FEV1 is the big one to look at here. The FEV1% is above 70, so that is normal. So the FEV1 was at 50%, and remember, FEV1 is the volume at 1 liter, so if they're a restrictive issue, are they going to be able to exhale large volume at one liter if they don't have a lot of volume to begin with? No. So you're like, Derek, why aren't we going by the FEV1? Because if there is an issue there and their flow rates are fine, the FEV1% is the big one. That's the big one. Uh, if the FEV1% is normal, and FEV1 can be low if they have a restrictive issue, which in this case, we have a restrictive issue. I know the number is a little jumbled here, right? They need to be lined up better. But... Um, uh, of course, measured, predicted, percent of predicted. Um, so this is a, a, a classic case of a patient that has a restrictive issue. Their, uh, their flow rates were fine, but their volumes were all decreased. Their volume at one second was decreased. Their overall volumes, both of these, were decreased. So that would be a classic restrictive result. Let's do another one. All right, challenge three, uh, same thing, measured, predicted, percent of predicted. All right, I'm going to make my little scorecard over here, uh, restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flow. 
however you want to look at it. All right, so, uh, so far my slow vital capacity is normal. My force vital capacity, ooh, 75%, ooh. Let's come back to that one. I'm gonna go down to my FEV 1%. My FEV 1%, normal should be 70% or above. Uh, this person only got 50%. So that shows me that this is decreased. I have a decreased flow rate. I had a normal volume. Oh, wait a second, Derek. What about my forced vital capacity? Wasn't that low? Because normal's 80 to 120% are predicted. Yeah, that's low as well. However, just like we were talking about before, with patients that have obstructive airways disease, especially with premature closure of the airways, are they going to be able to exhale really fast and not have closure? No, they might have premature closure. So that's why we did the slow vital capacity, right? We did a slow vital capacity here, uh, and it showed that their volume is fine. It's just when they exhale really fast that their volume isn't fine. In other words, there's air trapping when they exhale fast. That's what we're seeing here. So this is actually just an obstructive issue. This is an obstructive patient. It's not restricted because they do have a normal vital capacity. So do you see the importance of a slow vital capacity? If we, if we did not do a slow vital capacity on this patient, if we just did forced only, then you would think this patient has a combined issue, right? Because you just have a low vital capacity and a low flow rate. So you'd say this patient has a combined disease process when in fact, because you did a slow vital capacity on top of this, then you were able to show that it's not a combined issue. It is just an obstructive issue, obstructive disease issue. Isn't that pretty neat? So there is value to that. So if there's a question of obstructive airways disease, uh, that's where a slow vital capacity really can be handy. All right, challenge question number four. Once again, these are a little jumbled here, but I'll see if I can do some line drawing that'll make this make sense, uh, sort of. All right, <laughs> uh, let's do my scorecard. I'll have to redo these slides. All right, uh, so restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flows, however you want to do the scorecard. All right, vital capacity, 100% of predicted. So right now I got normal ca capacity, right? The lungs have a normal container size, so that's good. So am I thinking restrictive? No. All right, uh, their force vital capacity is low. It is low, right? Uh, so this is the same one that we're looking at here. Uh, and so when we're looking at this, that FEV 1% is gonna be one of the bigger ones. It tells us that, hey, we have low flow rates, but because we have low flow rates and, uh, and our FVC is low compared to our vital capacity, that tells me it's an air trapping situation. So this patient has obstructive disease with air trapping. All right, let's do a new challenge, new challenge. All right, we got a patient, uh, restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flow, however you want to look at it. Uh, so I got a force vital capacity of three liters, which is 90% of predicted. So right now, that's normal, right? They did not do a slow vital on this patient, shame on them. But uh, so we got that as normal. Uh, the FEV1 is at 2.55 liters. Uh, ooh, it doesn't give me that. Okay, uh, FEF 25 to 75% is 88% of predicted. And their exhale time is three seconds. So when you're looking at this patient, how do I know what their flow rate was, right? So this is where you got to compare their FEV1 to, right, I'm hearing you think about it. How do I get an FEV1% is what we're looking at here. So you're like, I don't know where we're at with this, Derek. Uh, well, I need you to get me an FEV 1% because will I give you this on the exam? Will I make you calculate an FEV 1%? Of course I will, right? So if their FEV 1 is 2.55 liters and we're going to divide that by 3 liters equals, anyone? You're just waiting for me to say it. <laughs> Uh, that equals 85%. Uh, 
So normal is anything above 70%. So their, their flow rate is actually normal as well. So do you see that I will make you do this, right? FUV1 2.55 out of three, right? Or sorry, the other way around. But uh, when we're looking at this, I'm going to make you sort of go through this and calculate it uh, to make sure that you got this down. So normal, right? 85% are predicted. All right, new challenge. Uh, you got a patient with uh, 2.8 liters for spinal capacity. So restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flow. All right, for spinal capacity is 50% are predicted. Well, that's not good. So right now I'm thinking restrictive. Okay, uh, FEV1 is 2.5 liters. So now I need to divide this, 2.5 into 2.8. Uh, so it shouldn't take a lot of mathematical manipulation to see that that's pretty much uh, 89 to 90% uh, predicted. So that means the flow rate's normal. So this means we have a restrictive disease process. Not only that, but look at the time it took for them to exit, a lot less than three seconds. So that could, uh, a lot less than six seconds, excuse me. So that's a big sign that this could easily be uh, a restrictive issue because they don't have enough container to, to empty. And there we go. We see that FEV1 is normal, right? 89%, so that's well above 70%. Uh, but the volume is low, which would be the force of capacity. And that's why this is a restrictive pathology. All right, the next challenge. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flow. Okay, so same thing here. We got a patient, uh, they're 80% of predicted for their restrictive. So normal is 80 to 120, so this is normal. And then I'm gonna let their FEV1. All right, FEV1, I'm gonna compare it to their FVC. So half of what it should be, right? FVC is four liters, they're only exhaling two liters. So that's 50%, which is decreased flow rates. So that's gonna be obstructive for sure. Look at this, the 25 to 75%, they did that one for us. It's at 60% of predicted. Not only that, but look at this. See how long it took them to exhale? It took them 15 seconds. This goes back to time constants. Back in pulmonary EMP, remember these are long, slow lung units. They've lost elasticity, so it's taking them a long time to exhale. These are patients, if you put them on a ventilator when their lungs are like this, if you set a really fast breathing rate on the ventilator, what's gonna happen to the gas in their lungs? It's just gonna keep building up and building up and building up, right? So these are the patients where we need to have them uh, set a lower respiratory rate when we put them on a ventilator. We need to give them that time to exhale, right? So here we see an obstructive disease pathology. So here it is looking at it again, this is obstructive. Uh, same thing, just I don't have my scorecard here, but you see a pattern start to develop. I want you to start to see the patterns. Restrictive patterns, low volumes, uh, obstructive patterns, low flow rates, uh, combined conditions, both of them are low. So it's just teasing out volume uh, and flow rates, uh, flow rates, right? Uh, and then that can be an indicator to the time that they take, uh, can be an indicator of how slow or how fast their lungs are, right? The slower the lungs, the more obstructive, the, the, the faster the lungs, the more the restrictive issue. All right, let's do another practice. Here we have restrictive to volumes, obstructive to flow, however you want to put it together. All right, uh, here I got force of capacity at 39% are predicted. Oh heavens, that is decreased. Uh, and we'll assume uh, that that's, that would be mirrored on a slow vital capacity as well, since they didn't do one here. Uh, FEV1 uh, is 900 mLs compared to 1.5 liters. 900 mLs compared to, uh, 900 mLs, uh, compared to 1.5 liters is around 60%, right? So their flow rates are also decreased. 25 to 
60% predicted, that's also decreased. So here we have an issue where we have both restrictive to volumes and obstructed flow rates. So this is a combined condition. So here you see, right, uh, pretty poor there, pretty poor overall. So hopefully going through these helped. Uh, we'll do some more practice, obviously, in class together. But hopefully going through these slowly, creating your own little scorecard to see restrictive pattern, obstructive pattern, combined pattern uh, can help you out as well. All right, moving on. What do, makes a test acceptable? Well, it should in, exhale for at least six seconds, at least six seconds. Uh, that's hopefully uh, you've got all of it out by six seconds. And like I said, some patients like that one example we just went through, maybe a little more than six seconds there. Uh, so severe obstructive issues can take up to 15 seconds. Same thing with severe restrictions. Maybe they only last four seconds with the exhalation. So those are issues that you'll see out there as well. But it should be at least, there should be a T there, at least six seconds. Um, there must be no coughing or hesitation. Uh, if there's coughing, that throws everything off. Most um, of the spirometry uh, software will obviously tell you that they've had something going on there. There should be a distinguishable plateau, which shows effort, right? Remember when we were talking about Sylvaton, we have to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and then back up again. There should be a plateau at end inhale and end exhale that shows you got the maximum effort out of their breath. So what makes a test acceptable? Well, there should be uh, three reproducible tests. Uh, they should all be within 150 mLs or 5% of each other. Uh, should be no more than six attempts, right? They can tire out pretty easily and you guys will practice this. So uh, you'll find out for yourselves it can be pretty fatiguing. Uh, what we're, when we do this, we're going to use the largest force vital capacity and the largest FEV1 reported. And then we're going to calculate the FEV1%. And I have some examples in your blackboard of doing this together. We'll do this together in class. Uh, all the flow values will come from what's called the best test. The best test is the largest numerical sum of FEV, FEC and FEV1. Um, so we look at those, and once we get that, we transfer them. All right, that made no sense to me, Derek. Well, that's great because I have an example to go through with you because, yeah, if I was in your shoes, of course, that would make no sense to me either. So here is an example of best test. Force vital capacity. All right, what I'm going to do, step one, is with my force vital capacity, I'm going to take the largest number. So the largest number, 5.35, uh, and transfer it over. All right. That's step one. All right, what's step two? Well, step two is take the FEV1 and transfer the largest number over. Uh, 4.41 is the largest one. 4.41. All right, I got steps one and two done. Now is the fun part, if you will. I'm going to do some mathematics. Yay. I'm going to take these two, the FVC and FEV1, and I'm going to add them together. Let me change colors here. All right. So I'm going to add 5.2 to 4.41, which is 9.61. All right. Then I'm going to take the next one. 5.3 plus 4.35. Do you see the? Do you see what I'm doing? 5.3 plus 4.35 equals 9.65. All right, and then same with the third one. 5.35 plus 4.36. Uh, 9.71. Ooh. So by far, that one has the largest numerical value. Okay, you're like, I don't know what we just did there. Well, wait a second. All right, step three and step four. All right, step three is going to be calculate our FEV1%. So that's this one, the FEV1 to FVC, that's the FEV1%. So do I just take the largest number and bring it over? No, I got to take these two numbers. 
4.41 and 5.35 and I need to divide them right to get their percent so 4.41 out of 5.35 is 82 percent so to get this number I do not look at these numbers you do not look at those. That's a common mistake I see on the exam. People just take the largest number from that category and bring it over. No, don't do that. You see, we have to take the FEV1 and the FVC that we pulled over to the best test, and we divide those to get the true FEV1%. Okay, so that's step three is to get our FEV1%. And final step four, which is where you sum, and I did it a little earlier, sum up these two, the FEV1 and FVC. Whichever one has the highest values, then we're going to bring those values on over. So we determined that the 9.71 was the largest values. So that means the flow rates all these flow rates here all we're going to do is just copy them over 3.94 sorry uh 3.41 1.89 9 9.89 all right so this one shows the best uh test three trial three shows the best effort because it had the largest sum of fbc and fev1 so that means that the flow rates from that test that trial three that test three uh, were the ones that we need to record for the best test so once again step one take the largest fvc step two take the largest fev1 step three calculate your fev1 percent step four sum up your fev1 fvcs whichever one has the highest numerical value transfer those numbers over to the best test and we'll practice this together uh, hopefully this little thing helped out a little bit so what makes the slow vital and force vital important well if they look at obstruction and restriction uh, and we can see if it's a combined issue uh, if it, we just did forced vital capacity only then it could misdiagnose someone as a combined condition if we just did slow vital only we wouldn't get flow rates so they work well together it's a beautiful dance right so they both work together to help solve a problem they both work uh, to help us diagnose or to solve the problem of getting the quantification of someone's pulmonary function. All right, peak flow meters. So sort of a new thing. This is something that anybody could do at home. They can do at work. They can do at school. Uh, this is just measured during a force vital capacity. So we'll get what's known as the peak expiratory flow rate, PE. F R and we already did see it in that graphic that I pointed out that flow volume loop where you seen it in there so if you want to rebind back to there um, so that's something we get off of the pulmonary function equipment or it could be something like this device here right that measures peak flow um, and so it is effort dependent so don't let your patients cheat uh, they stick their tongue in there or they don't see their mouth around it right there's a bunch of ways they could uh, not give you accurate tests um, they get three attempts uh, the two largest should be within 5% of each other, which means you got the max effort out of that patient, uh, and you don't average them. Whatever the highest value that, that there is during that test, record it, just like what we just did uh, less than a minute ago in that best test. We're going to take their best FEV1, or in this case, their peak expiratory flow rate. We're going to take it and transfer it on over, right? So effort dependent two largest should be within 5% of each other, uh, and then that's going to show us it. So we're going to average it. So we're not going to average it, is what I just said. We're not going to average it. We're going to take the best test or the best value that they blow. Um, we want to make sure that we record their personal best, right? Uh, we can set it based upon their high age gender, right, for to start with, but then we need to get them to determine their own baseline. So then we can set 80% of their baseline, 50% of their baseline to determine their zones for care. So we need them to figure out what their personal best is. And that may not be why they're in the hospital. It may be, you know, as an outpatient. So that's something they need to record and let uh, their providers know. 
Uh, what we try to do when we send someone home with this is to have them do it every morning and night to determine their personal best. So we compare everything to their personal best, and that's why it's important that we get their personal best. So why not compare it to a predicted value? If I already have severe asthma, and I gave you that story in the previous lecture, uh, and if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to it. Um, when we're looking at their their normal values, it's based upon the height, age, gender compared to what their personal value is. So if I have someone that has severe asthma or obstructive airways disease, will they ever get to a perfectly healthy lung person's flow rates? They may not. And so therefore they can't ever uh, get to uh, uh, where they're not taking a lot of medication. So we need to set it based upon their best. So we can start off with doing what's compared to normal lungs, but once we determine their personal best, that's what we're gonna use to set our zones. Uh, this one, why do we do peak flow rates? Well, it can help us determine if the patient's asthma is getting worse, if their flow rates keep going down and down and down. That's why you see these zones. You see this red, yellow, green zone. If this person right here is in their yellow zone, well, that means something. If they're in their red zone, well, that means something. That means that we can escalate care and get them the appropriate care that they need without giving a, overdoing it, making them go to hospital for every small little uh, asthma exacerbation or anything like that. So it's a very helpful device. So let's look at what the zones mean. I will ask you this on the exam, of course. Uh, these are the zones. If someone's in their red zone, that means they're 50% of their peak flow or less, right? Their personal best peak flow. Um, that means that they usually have a cough or wheezing. It means they're having trouble breathing. They're, they're usually unable to talk, walk, or play. Um, blue lips or fingernails, right? Acrocinosis, central cyanosis. What's their action plan if this is the case? Uh, especially pediatric patients, notify their parents, give medication per their action plan, which could be a short acting bronchodilator, uh, a nebulizer in a lot of cases too. So this is why we set these people up with the peak flow meter. So if they're in their red zone and they're seeing these symptoms, we can get them help fast without having to delay care. What if they're in their yellow zone? Well, that's your 50 to 79% of predicted, right? So anything less than 50% would be their red zone. Uh, 50 to 75, uh, 50 to 89, or 50 to 79 percent uh, would be their yellow zone. This means they're still coughing and wheezing. Coughing is usually one of the first signs of an asthma uh, situation. They might have some tightness in their chest or shortness of breath, but if they're in their yellow zone, uh, it means you're going to follow their asthma action plan, which might be take their inhaler, a couple extra puff, contact their parents, stay away from triggers like certain allergens if they have extrinsic asthma or intrinsic. So knowing the triggers is actually one of the best ways to treat asthma is uh, knowing your triggers because then you will stop it from happening in the first play, place. So, and this is just like I said, meant for more pediatric patients, but monitor their status, right? This isn't a go into the hospital right away situation. This is a up there in their yellow zone. Let's see if we can get them out of their yellow zone situation. The green zone means that they're 80% of their personal best or above which means, hey, just continue to avoid anything that triggers, right? If uh, uh, smoky air or allergens or anything like that, whatever it is that triggers your asthma, just stay away from them. Uh, make sure you have your medication if you do go into one of these other categories. But other than that, continue living your life, right? The green zone. So when we do a peak flow meter setup, we usually will set our zones, our green, yellow, red zones. Red zones is 50% of their predicted or below. Yellow is 50% uh, to 80, 79%. Uh, and then 80% and above would be their green zone. So that's where the asthma action plan comes into play. Uh, and so I do need you to know this. This is a good slide to pay attention to. What are symptoms if they're in the red zone compared to symptoms in the yellow zone? Is there cyanosis in the yellow zone? Is there cyanosis in the green zone? Uh, which one means immediate medical attention? Which one says, be cautious, you might need to monitor? Which one says, hey, you're good to go play? All right, so that was peak flow. There's other kinds of studies called the pre and post bronchodilator studies. They show how reactive your airways are. Uh, and so this is to determine the reversibility of airway obstructions, the reversibility. So you're gonna do a PFT 
you're going to have them do a, a force vital capacity uh, and you're going to get a pre-value and then you're going to wait usually 10 to 15 minutes uh, for the medication to kick in and then you're going to do a post uh, and you're going to do a, have them do a force vital capacity again so you want to see that uh, FEV1 percent in order to do this to begin with it has to be less than 70 percent so when you do their baseline without any medication in their system it needs to be less than 70 percent overall um, when we see this like I said it's trying to look at reversibility and if they're over 70 percent that's within their normal limits so what's the point of doing it if they're within their normal limits that's why they say it's got to be less than 70 percent so a positive result in other words it means that they're reversible so positive means that they're reversible, uh, means that we see a 12% increase in their FEV 1% and or an increase in their, in their volume by 200 mLs. That means they're able to exhale more because there's less air being trapped in their lungs. So if we see a 12% increase in their FEV 1% or an increase in 200 mLs, that's a sign we got bronco reactivity or reversibility uh, from that medication. Uh, so we'll see that percent change, which we've already looked at percent change pre-drug versus post-drug. Uh, and then you move the decimal over two spaces over pre-drug. Um, so this is just your calculation to determine the percent change. So if we're going to do a pre and post PFT, or if we're just going to come in for a complete PFT, we need to make sure that they haven't had any beta agonists for at least four hours. So when's the last time they took their albuterol? Four hours ago? Okay. If it's been more than four hours, we're good to go. If it's been two hours, then we're going to have to wait another two hours. Uh, uh, Saba, sustained beta actionists, uh, those usually are 12 hour medications or longer, so that is going to be 12 hours for a hold there. Uh, parasympatholytics, usually they want an eight hour hold. Inhaled steroids don't affect our PFT use at all or PFT values. Remember, inhaled corticosteroids are to help maintain or reduce inflammation in the airways. So withholding it, and they take four weeks to build up with their inhaled steroids. So uh, withholding inhaled steroids uh, is not appropriate for pulmonary function testing traditionally. All right, so we've looked at that uh, pre and post to look at airway reversibility. Now let's look at how we can look at diffusion of gas, and that's the DLCO, which we've talked about in other courses, and uh, we'll review it here as well. This is looking at the diffusing capacity, how easy or hard it is for gas to get from the alveoli into the capillary membrane. So it can be decreased with obstructive or restrictive disease. So it's not really looking at obstructive or restrictive, it's just looking at the AC membrane health, right? So we're going to use a point 3% carbon monoxide and then we'll have a little bit of helium mixed in there and of course oxygen and whatever's left over we'll throw in nitrogen but it's 0.3% carbon monoxide not 3% right the boards will ask you what percentage to use don't use 3% use 0.3% um, a normal value for DLCO here you do need to know this for boards 25 milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury 25 mLs per minute per millimeter of mercury. Once again, 25 mLs per minute per millimeter of mercury. If the DLCO is low, that means our, we're having a hard time diffusing. Usually means we have a restrictive disorder like interstitial lung disease could be going on, right? Because we have less surface area. Uh, if, the, if it's low DLCO and they have obstructive flow rates, then that usually means emphysema right so that's the big one there the dlco if you see low flow rates and a low dlco we're thinking emphysema if you see low flow rates and a normal dlco it rules out emphysema traditionally not a physician but just saying uh so usually if the the that surface area gets destroyed with emphysema if you go back to look at our lung slides surface area just gets destroyed with emphysema so that's when the dlco will be decreased with obstructive flow rates and emphysema so if you see low flow rates and a low dlco think emphysema 
Uh, what would it be a DLCO with an asthmatic? Well, it'd be normal, right? A normal diffusion into there. Uh, so it'd be normal, or if there's a lot of inflammation, it could actually be increased if there's a lot of inflammation going on as well. So we'll just say that it's normal for now. So how do we test a DLCO? What's the procedure? Well, you can either do what's called the steady state, where you have them breathe that concentration until they reach a steady state, and then we're going to measure it there. Or what's most popular is the single breath DLCO. Uh, you're going to use that once again, mixture of helium, 0.3%, uh, mixture of carbon monoxide, sorry, 0.3% with 10% helium, room air, and the rest of it nitrogen. Uh, we're going to have one breath hold for 10 seconds. So you're going to have them exhale, and then you're going to have them inhale where you give them the gas. So you're going to have them breathe normal. Then you're going to have them exhale, and then once they're down here, this is where you're going to change it and be like, give them the carbon monoxide, right? And then they take a deep breath in and they hold it for 10 seconds, right? 10 seconds and then they're going to exhale again and then back up to normal. So this is where they have that gas and it, they're holding it for 10 seconds. Uh, and when we know how much carbon monoxide we gave them, and then we're going to look at how much they exhaled. If they exhaled hardly anything that was carbon monoxide, then that means they have good diffusion. If we gave them 0.3% carbon monoxide and they're exhaling 0.3% carbon monoxide, that means hardly the carbon monoxide got diffused. That means their diffusion is poor, right? So we're measuring the difference between inhalation and exhalation. We know how much uh, carbon monoxide we gave them, then whatever is left over after they exhaled, that's the balance. That's what we're trying to see. The bigger the difference, the better the diffusion. The smaller the difference, the worse the diffusion. So what we're doing this, small amount of carbon monoxide, remember, 0.3%, 0 0.3%. Uh, I just don't want you messing that question. Most of it will get into the blood, bind to the hemoglobin. Uh, and then remember here, the other thing to be aware in this test, and it's in uh, some of the materials I gave you is to wait at least four minutes in between each procedure. Usually we'll do this twice. Um, the two tests should be within three millimeters of mercury of each other, um, three of each other. But um, so we want to wait at least four minutes to let it clear the system. The other thing that we got to do with this, especially if they're a smoker, is do a baseline uh, carbon monoxide hemoglobin test or carbamino. Uh, hemoglobin, sorry, carboxy hemoglobin test. So when we're looking at it, we need to make sure that they don't have a baseline high level as well. So we can do this with the blood test, or there's even a pulse ox out there uh, by Massimo that can look at carbon monoxide hemoglobin as well that we can use. So wait four minutes in between the test, 0.3%. Uh, we're just measuring inhaled versus exhaled. The more that the that we see that doesn't come back out, that means the better it is for gas to get into your bloodstream. So what are some things that will increase or decrease the DLCO? Well, DLCO can be increased when you're laying supine, if you have uh, athletics uh, where they are really efficient with their breathing, if you have a lot of red blood cells, COPD, um, left to right shunts, asthma, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage where you're bleeding into your lungs, uh, good pasture syndrome. Uh, good pasture syndrome would actually be increasing DLCO. It's where hemoglobin, literally uh, red blood cells, will hemorrhage into your lung tissue and therefore causes uh, increased diffusion, but it's not really increased diffusion. It's just looking like it because the red blood cells absorbed it instead of it actually going into the bloodstream. So if someone's laying supine, which we don't do this test on those patients traditionally, athletes, uh, polycythemia, left to right shunts. Uh, so let's say they had a patent foramen of valve, so a hole in there. Here, let me draw a heart. Let's say there's a hole in there, and then their uh, left atria and right atria. So let's say the pressure is higher in the left atria. This would be a left to right shunt. It's throwing good blood into the bad side, to the right atrial side. So that'd be a left to right shunt, which means that there's gonna be more pulmonary blood flow. 
right? So we're cycling blood, more blood back into the lungs and therefore more blood flow. So it's very similar to a polycythemia situation, more blood to absorb the carbon monoxide. Asthma, we talked about that with inflammation, where that could be increased, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, where, where there's blood in the alveoli, right? So all those can increase the DLCO. What about decreased? Well, emphysema is going to be the big one on the list, especially if there's low flow rates and low DLCO. You're thinking emphysema. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, where a really thick AC membrane, or we lose surface area, like a pneumonectomy, you lose surface area, like with uh, morbid obesity. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, where you don't have a lot of uh, vascular open space because we're vasoconstricted. Uh, so we're losing surface area of the vascularity. Uh, multiple PEs, where we're losing the ability to flow blood through there. Or something like a boop pneumonia, bronchiolitis, obliterons, organizing pneumonias. Uh, and you can go look those over, but we'll talk about that in disease class as well. But uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a lot of things that decrease the ability for gas to get across the AC membrane. It's usually either surface area related or uh, perfusion related when we're looking at that. All right, last test I believe that we'll talk about is the maximum voluntary ventilation. This is everybody's favorite test to yell at the patient about. Uh, this is where you have them breathe deep and as fast as you can for 12 to 15 seconds. Deep and fast. <gasps> really deep, really fast, at least uh, uh, as much as you can get the patient to do it. Uh, they want to move them as much air as possible in and out of the spirometer. Uh, try to do it at least two times. Um, the two largest should be within 10%, uh, but be aware this is one of the most fatiguing ones out there, uh, and that's why we usually save it for last when we're doing a complete PFT. Uh, this one is the best look at overall ventilation status because it looks at the muscles, it looks at the neurocontrol. Um, it's not specific really to restrictive obstructive, but it's more looking at muscles and neurocontrol uh, and drive to breathe, that type of stuff. So pretty helpful there. The big thing is going to understand how do we know if it's normal? What determines normal? Well, we can take their FEV1. times 35 and I know your book says 40 so just bear with me FEV1 times 35 or 40 uh, and that will tell us what a normal MVV should be what if I take their MVV and divide it by 35 I should also get their FEV1 so you see how that works so if their FEV1 was a very good effort I got a really good FEV1 but I'm worried about their effort on the MVV, then I can do this, right? So I can take the MVV divided by 35, and if it's lower than the FEV1, it's a sign their effort wasn't great, and I need to redo the MVV. If the MVV is higher than the FEV1, then that's a sign I need to go back and redo the FEV1, I know. Right, so it tells us about effort. So uh, 35 is what's traditionally used out there. I know your book says 40, but 35 is what's traditionally used. Uh, so these numbers obviously should be within 10% of each other. How do I know if I got good effort on my MVV? I divide it by 35 to get to my FEV1. If my FEV1 is lower than my MVV, then I know I need to go back and redo my FEV1. All right, here's the picture, right? Uh, you're going to have the patient breathe rapid and deep for that 10 to 12 seconds, right? Uh, rapid and deep, rapid and deep, rapid and deep. This is where the patient could pass out, right, by hyperventilating. So be very careful. They might see stars, get tingly lips, things like that. Uh, that's all uh, something that could easily happen with this, but coaching is going to be a big one on this one. Uh, this is the best test for the overall function of the respiratory system. Hey, that's bold and underlined, and I just circled it on the recorded lecture. Just saying. Uh, it's influenced by air resistance, how strong or weak your respiratory muscles are, how compliant or uncompliant your lungs or chest wall is, uh, your ventilatory control mechanisms, your neuro drive to breathe. Let's say you have a brain tumor, a glioblastoma meningioma or something like that. Uh, that can easily impact it. So that's why it's 
the best overall. It looks at the whole big picture. Now, is it specific to any one of those? No, but it's a good picture of your overall. It's an umbrella test. Uh, this will decrease with age, sorry, right? Uh, a decrease with moderate to severe obstruction, right? You can't move gas, can be normal in restrictive disease, and it depends on effort and cooperation. Uh, so this is one of the harder ones out there uh, to coach because it's trying to get them to care about it. Uh, and this is a good one, like I said, for overall function. And this is our last one that we usually do when we do a complete PFT. Uh, so hopefully by then they're ready to get out of there and they'll give you their best effort just to get out of there. <laughs> All right, volume versus flow test. So this is another way of looking at that sort of division there. Uh, direct spirometry versus indirect spirometry. <clears throat> Things that are directly measured. Vital capacity, inspiratory capacity, inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, ERV, uh, FEV time, force vital capacity just from direct spirometry, right? So we can see those things. By doing those things, we can see and compare it to things like the body plasmography, the nitrogen washout, the helium dilution. Those sound familiar? Yes, by those, we can compare it to those and see what the residual volume, the FRC, and their total lung capacity is. So if we do a uh, body box, I'll just do BEB for short, or body plasmography, uh, helium dilution or the nitrogen washout. Those three, we're gonna to compare to what we get from the direct spirometry. Therefore, we can measure or calculate what their total lung capacity, their FRC, and their residual volume is. What about obstructive flow rates? Well, we can measure the FEV 1% directly, which is great, uh, 25 to 75% gives us that. Uh, we can also look at the loops, which I have the next slide is loops. Uh, the loops look at peak expiratory flow rate, which is great for obstructive airways, right? And then the VMAX 50, how much flow that they have in their lungs or out of their lungs, right? So here's an example from Rupal, a uh, great resource, obviously not a book that you guys get here, great resource for pulmonary function testing. And so here we see a normal in the dotted line, you see a normal flow volume loop. However, what does their flow volume loop look like with different disease conditions? So this is a little pattern, if you will. This is a great little thing to put on your badge if you're gonna go do a PFT clinicals, right? If you're gonna do something like that. So what you're looking at here is with asthma, do they have a high peak flow rate? No, their peak flow rate decreases. And then also, are they able to, uh, their, their volumes are trapped a little bit. So their volumes are gonna be decreased and their flow rates decrease. So that's why we wanna see a 12% increase in their flow rate and or a 200 ml increase in their expiratory volume, right? Their vital capacity. Uh, so that's what you see there from asthma. Emphysema, oh heavens, do you see this? So their peak flow rates decrease, which we already know that about obstructive, but look at this. You see this? It's called scooping. It looks like a scoop that's out of there. Uh, that's a classic sign. You can even see that with some asthmatics as well. Um, so you'll see the scooping and that's a sign. Okay, not only that, but their small airways, there's a lot of obstruction in their small airways. So this is where we look at the air trapping side of it when you see it there. Restrictive disease, uh, here you see their, their volumes significantly decreased but the, the graph looks the same, it's just smaller, right? So that's restrictive. So the graph looks the same, it's just a mini mini version, there you go. Uh, variable intrathoracic versus extrathoracic obstructions, um, and then fixed airway obstructions, you'll see the fixed airway obstruction typically on inspiratory, which would be this, uh, uh, this part down here, uh, and then expiratory up here. Uh, it, it, uh, usually you'll see the fixed look with um, people with artificial airways, so tracheostomy, ET tube patients, they're on a ventilator. That's that typical flow volume loop that you'll see there. Variable extrathoracic and intrathoracic. If someone has a vocal cord dysfunction, 
Uh, you could easily see that on the inspiratory side of their flow rates, right? Because they're having trouble getting gas into the lungs because their vocal cords are blocking or obstructing the flow rate. Uh, extra thoracic, right? So hopefully you see here this pattern of these flow volume loops. So if I'm trying to determine if a patient has asthma versus uh, vocal cord dysfunction, I can do a flow volume loop and look at, does it look like this one or does it look like this one? Right? Does it look like the asthma one where it's a smaller peak flows? Inspiratory side is pretty normal, just low. Or oh, they're down here. Look at the, the expiratory side is fine, but the inspiratory side is low. So we can really see a lot of differences here and help um, these patients understand what's going on with them better. So long presentation. I'll end it here. Uh, so make sure you go through, understand the different tests, making a table is going to be very helpful. So make a table for slow vital capacity. What is it? What's the procedure? What determines acceptability? What patients is it for flows? Is it for volumes, right? Uh, what is it for? Uh, the next one, uh, uh, force vital capacity. Flows, volumes, it's the most common one. What's acceptable, what's reproducible. Uh, FV, MVV, FVC, uh, 25 to 75%, 200 to 1200. Uh, uh, pre and post bronchodilator studies. Bronco provocation, which we haven't talked about here, which we'll talk about in class. Um, so it's making that chart or that table can really help put these things into a lot more digestible format. So you can listen to this over and over again. However, I recommend doing that visual table, like making a table uh, of the different tests and what their advantage is, what the reproducibility is, and so on and so forth, um, is going to be very valuable to you to break this down. All right, that's it for now. Thank you.